Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Masmora, Dungeons of Arcadia, designed by Daniel Elvez with development and publishing by Simon Games. Although set in the same universe as Arcadia Quest, this is not an expansion. It's a very different game, as we'll see, where each player will take on the role of a single hero delving into a dungeon to find treasures, avoid traps, and fight monsters, all in an effort to become the most accomplished adventurer. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, first sort all of the dungeon tiles by size and the Roman numerals and other values you'll find here on their backs. There's also two double-sided tiles, and these you can just set aside for now. Then return to the box this large dungeon and smaller tile marked with these swords. They're only used in the Epic and Alliance versions of the game, which we'll refer to later. Now, depending on the number of players, you may need to remove a certain number of some of these tiles based on the values found here. For example, this stack you'd only include in a three or more player game. In this video, we'll set up for a two player game and remove all tiles marked for three, four, and five players. From all stacks that remain, shuffle together any that match size and the Roman numerals on the back, leaving you with four stacks remaining, known as the small level one and level two stacks and the medium level one and level two stacks. From the small level one stack, turn over the top tile and place it on top. If this shows a red border, it's a trap and you'd shuffle it back in and then reveal a new tile on top until you're no longer showing a trap like say this one. Of the two tiles that you set aside earlier, place this second level entrance on top of the small level two stack. All of these can now be set to the side of the table within easy reach, and then you'll place this starting room in the center of the play area. Nearby, but off to the side, place these dice and the gold and boss tokens. These are treasure cards, shuffle them into a face down pile, and then deal two to each of the players. These Treasure Alliance and Evil cards can be returned to the box, as they're only used in the cooperative variant for the game. Each player now chooses one of the hero miniatures. These have colored bases which snap onto the bottom, as I've already done here. Then collect the matching board and cards for your hero, which should be placed underneath, like this, in either order. Also take the free move token matching your color, and wound token placing it on the sixth space here. This is the experience board. Find each player's matching colored experience tracker and stack them onto the zero space. Then place the heroes on this start room. All players can now take both of these double-sided player aids. Finally, give the youngest player this first player token and these six black action dice. In the box, you'll also find Arcadia Quest cards so you can use the figures from Masmora in that game, but we won't need those here. And that's the setup. Mass Mora comes with two alternative ways to play the game, Alliance and Epic Mode, both of which build on the rules from the standard game, which is what we're going to learn in this video. And in the standard game, players will be racing to be the most experienced hero to emerge from the dungeon. The game is played over a series of rounds in which each player will take a turn. And on your turn, you'll complete two phases, starting with the hero phase. Here, you'll take the six black action dice, and roll them. You may then re-roll any number of them, accepting that as the final result. Now you'll perform actions, and these will mostly be paid for using the dice that you rolled. Actions can be performed in any order, as many times as you wish, as long as you can pay for them. And we'll go over each of the different actions right now. One option is to use magic by spending a die with this magic symbol. Spent dice are placed into this used area of your hero card, meaning they won't be used again this turn. Spending a magic symbol allows you to change any one of your other unused dice to a side of your choosing. Another action is using your hero's ability, which is listed here. In some cases, it may have an ongoing effect that has no cost, but it may instead show a space for a die like this. To activate this kind of ability, you must put a die matching its symbol into its space and then you resolve its listed effect. In this case, we'd gain a magic symbol allowing us to change a die. Placing a die in this way is called docking it, which makes it unavailable for the rest of the turn, just like when we place a die here. Docked abilities also can't be used again the turn on which they've already been used. Now I did say when placing a docked die, it has to match the symbol. However, if it shows a question mark, then you can place a die with any symbol in that space. So as we've seen, dice can provide symbols, 
and effects like this create symbols. And both can be spent, but with some restrictions. For example, only action dice can be used to pay for a docking effect. Dice can also be used at any point during your turn, but any symbols you generate in other ways can only be used in the room that they were generated in. As soon as you would leave a room, then any of those symbols you generated are lost. As we'll see later, over the course of the game, your hero will level up, causing the cards here to slide up, making new abilities available. Many of them will offer docking options that provide you with more symbols and even gold, which you'll collect from the supply. Some may instead cost gold to activate, like this one, which if you spend three gold, provides you with three of these symbols. If you also see these rotating arrow symbols with an ability, it means you can perform it as many times as you want, as long as you can pay the cost each time. Spending a die with this face provides you with two move points. These must be spent together. In other words, if you spend one point and then stop to perform a different action, the second move point is lost. Each point can be spent to either explore or move. You may explore if there's an empty area adjacent to a door leading from the room that your hero is in. Doors are the gaps that you find in the walls around the border. To explore, you'll take the top tile from the stack of the level that you're in. We start in level one, so we'll take this tile. If there are no small tiles left in the stack of your level, you can't explore that level further. Place the tile you gained so that a doorway from it matches a doorway from the tile that you're in. And then you must move into it. The symbols in the room may require you to take some additional steps, but we'll learn about all the different tiles a little bit later. Once you've completed any of those steps, you now turn over the top tile from the stack that you took from. If you turn over a room, place it face up on top of the stack. In this way, players can always see what kind of room they're going to explore next. However, if the revealed tile has a red border, it's a trap. Immediately place it adjacent to the new room that you just explored into. If there were no free spots to place it, then you put it on any free spot adjacent to any room within that level. Normally, rooms are only considered adjacent if they share a full edge and there's an open door between them. Trap rooms are an exception. They have no doors, so they can never be entered, but they're always considered adjacent to the rooms that they would share a side with. To be clear though, no rooms are ever adjacent diagonally. As soon as a trap is placed, it must be activated, which we'll learn about in a moment. You then flip over a new room on top of the appropriate stack, and if it was another trap, you'd place and activate it, repeating those steps until eventually a normal room is on top. Remember we said that when a trap is placed, it immediately activates. And this means that each hero in any room adjacent to the trap suffers one wound. Wounds are recorded on your hero card, reducing your marker by one, as I just did. Traps also activate every time any hero enters or leaves a room adjacent to a trap. Once again, damaging all heroes adjacent to the trap. Also keep in mind, traps will only affect heroes they'll never target monsters. A hero can disarm a trap in an adjacent room if during their turn they dock the dice pictured on it. Certain actions earn you experience points, which are represented by these dots here. So for disarming this trap, you gain two experience points, or as it's also referred to, XP. You show this by moving your marker that number of spaces on this track. After the trap is disarmed, you flip it over as a reminder that it will no longer activate. And the dice you would dock there you can then place on the used spaces of your hero board. Before explaining the other actions players can take, let's look at all the types of rooms you might add to the dungeon when exploring with the step action. If an explored room tile shows this skull symbol, then as soon as it enters play you must roll a blue minor monster and add it to that room from the supply. If a newly explored room instead shows this major monster symbol, instead roll and place a yellow major monster in it. This is a mixed monster room and it shows one of each symbol, so you take one of each die, roll them, and also add them to the room. If you can't place a particular monster type because they're all in use, let's say for example when putting out this dungeon tile, these monster dice had all been on this space. Any die you would then need, you then take from any other dungeon tile that doesn't have a hero in its space. So we take this one. You then roll it and place it in the new tile. If, however, there are no available monsters of a type, let's say all of the major monsters had been in here when this tile was revealed, then you simply don't add one. 
Now that we've seen how you add monsters to rooms, let's go back to this original one because we weren't quite finished with it yet. This is a treasure room, and when added to the dungeon, place a coin from the supply into each circular space. A hero in a treasure room can claim the gold, but they must first open the chest by docking a matching die here. You then collect the coin and add it to your personal supply, and gain any XP as shown by these dots. One XP in this case. You then also draw a new treasure card, and we'll learn about these a little bit later. Keep in mind, gold collected from dungeon tiles is never replaced. This is a gold room. When added, place gold into the appropriate spaces from the supply and spawn new monsters as required. Heroes here can take the gold on their turn without docking any dice, but it does not provide any XP. A hero in the healing fountain room can dock the indicated die to heal up to two wounds keeping in mind your health can never exceed a maximum of six. This is a pit room. A hero that enters it must immediately spend either a step die or a step symbol. And if they can't, or they choose not to, they immediately suffer one wound. When this tile known as the stairs to the second level enters play, heroes can now travel between it and the second level entrance for free. Players may still move to this tile and not travel to the second level, but the first time a player would choose to, they collect and place this second level entrance tile in a free area of the play space, moving to it and flipping over the next tile on the second level stack. Players exploring from here now draw and place tiles from this stack just as they do on the first level. Just remember, once a player is on either of these tiles, moving to the other one doesn't cost a step. This is a portal room. A hero here can dock the indicated die to teleport to any room on any level of the dungeon. And if teleporting from a space adjacent to a trap, it does not activate it. This is a web room. When a hero enters it, they must stop moving and immediately lose one step die or symbol if they have it. When a room contains an outline of a specific monster like this, you find the matching die and place it with that monster face up. We'll learn later how monsters move, but note that monsters must spend two move points to leave the web room, while heroes can leave it following the normal rules. Sometimes when exploring a new room, the next tile revealed contains instructions. The exploring player follows them if possible, in this case they're told to lose an action die, and then the tile is discarded and a new one is flipped over. For this example, let's say Algus is exploring in this direction. When one of these rune rooms would be entered to the dungeon, instead, replace it with a medium-sized tile from the stack of its level. This can be rotated in any direction as usual, as long as one of its doors connects to the room that it's being explored from. The hero then enters the room as normal and immediately gains one XP as shown here. Larger rooms tend to be a little more dangerous. The top tile from the smaller room tile stack is flipped over as usual, but medium level tiles remain face down. If there isn't enough room to place a medium sized tile, then you can't explore in that direction when you see a rune tile on top of the stack. You'll need to go to another door. When newly placed, add any treasures or monsters as shown, which may include boss tokens, which are double sided. Ensure the blue side is face up. I should mention there is a limit of three traps that can be connected to a new room when it's explored. For a larger room, if you would reveal more traps than that, place them next to any other room in that level of the dungeon where there's space. Also, while in a medium room, a hero here can explore or move out of any of its various unblocked doors. This is one medium-sized tile that's a little different than the others and we should take a look at. It's called the Dark Ritual Room. When it's first brought into play, add three cultist monster die to its spaces here. At the end of your turn, if there's at least one of these cultists left, replace any one of the cultists with the Dark Watcher major monster. Once this ritual is complete, it will not happen again. Now let's go back to talking about the take a step action given by this symbol. We learned about exploring in the different types of rooms that you may find, but you can also spend move points to move from one room to an adjacent revealed one. Don't forget, each of these symbols provides you with two move points, so from here I could explore or move again. Players also have this free step token, which they can flip at any point during their turn, even before rolling their dice, to gain two free movement points. At the start of your next turn, ensure that you flip this token back over so it can be used again. Players can also take the drink elixir action by spending these elixir symbols, and for each spent, 
they can heal one wound. But remember, you may never heal yourself beyond this furthest space. The final action is to fight a monster in your room. This is a very important action because as soon as you are in a room with one or more monsters, you must fight them all before taking any other kind of action. For example, if you start your turn in a room with a monster, then you must fight it first. Or if you're partway through your turn and then you explore into a room with a monster before doing anything else, you must fight the monster there. This means you can't drink potions to heal or collect treasures lying around or disable traps or anything until fully resolving that fight action. As long as you survive, even if monsters remain, you can then take any actions you like as normal. The one exception to this is that you may use hero abilities or play cards that generate symbols you can use directly in the fight. For example, if I play this card, it can generate two elixir symbols. Now I can't drink elixirs as an action to heal when I need to be resolving a fight, but some monsters, like the skeleton, can be attacked with these symbols. So for that specific purpose, because these symbols are being used in the fight, it would be okay to play this. And again, we'll learn more about treasure cards a little bit later. Normally, to defeat a monster, you'll use any combination of bows and swords, known as ranged and melee symbols, which inflict one damage each on a monster in your room. Every hero also has these symbols on their card, and that's because if you spend a sword and a shield die together, they count as a shield and two swords. This combo can only be made using dice, but you can make it multiple times during your turn as long as you have dice to spend each time. So if during an attack I played these two dice together and also played this bow, I've generated two melee attacks and one ranged for a total of three damage. We'll see how shields are used in just a moment. If the total damage of your attack equals or exceeds the monster's defense, which is shown inside of this shield symbol, then it is defeated. However, if you can't generate enough damage, then nothing happens to the monster. In this case, we created three points of damage, the ghoul has a defense of three, so the ghoul has been defeated. No matter what other symbols you use when attacking a monster in your room, if even one of those symbols used in the fight is a melee one, you are said to be making a melee attack against that monster. This means you had to get in close to them, and even if you defeated the monster, it performs payback, doing damage to your hero equal to this value. But for each shield symbol you spend, you can reduce that damage by one. So with a payback of three and using the shield symbol generated by the dice that we spent in this fight, we'll take two damage. Keep in mind again, until the fight is finished, you cannot use symbols for other effects and abilities. For example, we couldn't drink this elixir after taking the first point of damage. We'd have to take both of them. Only once a fight is over can you start taking other types of actions. Some symbols like elixir and magic count as ranged attacks depending on the monster's weaknesses, which you're reminded of on these reference charts. For example, the skeleton here, we're told, is immune to damage from ranged symbols, but elixirs can be used as a ranged attack. If all the symbols you use to defeat a monster are considered ranged ones, then the monster will not get to do its payback damage to you. So in this case, two damage would defeat this skeleton, which has a defense of two, and because they were ranged damage, it will not be able to do its payback attack. If there is more than one monster in a space, you fight all of them simultaneously. So add together any attack values you choose to spend and assign them to monsters as you like. Now that said, fighting a monster doesn't mean that you have to attack it. To resolve a required fight, you can save your dice and ignore one or more of the monsters, simply allowing them to do their payback damage directly to you. That counts as resolving the fight, and if you're still alive, you can take other actions as normal. So in this case, the wizard could combine the elixir and this melee symbol to defeat the skeleton, but has decided not to. The combined payback damage of these two monsters is three. The wizard decides to block two of that with shields and suffers only one damage. Now the wizard can do anything it likes in this space. He could collect the gold, move, explore, drink elixirs, and so on. Killing monsters, however, has its benefits. First of all, you gain an amount of XP equal to the dots on its face. It's then removed from the board and you draw a treasure card. As soon as you reach or exceed seven XP, defeating minor monsters provides you with one less XP than they normally would, which you're reminded of here. Bosses are these flat tokens and they work like regular monsters, except they're immune to effects that specify 
they target monsters. Also, the first time you defeat a boss, after gaining the benefits as usual, you flip it over to its red side. A red-colored boss cannot be attacked on the same turn that it was flipped over, but any hero can attack it on a future turn. And once defeated on its red side, the hero gains the benefits as normal, and then it's removed from the game. A boss, or a monster, showing these star symbols means that it has a special ability. And we won't go over all the boss and monster abilities, but again, you can find them on these reference sheets and in further detail in the rulebook. We've seen that you can gain treasure cards, but now let's look at how they work. These can be played at any point during your own turn to resolve the effect on the bottom purple half. Or you can choose to use its top orange effect instead, playing it at the time that it indicates, usually as an interruption to something else happening in the game. For example, for this top action, it says we can play it at any time. So maybe during another player's turn, I'm gonna stop them and say, I want to play this effect. If more than one interrupt effect is played in response to that same trigger, the effects are resolved backwards, meaning the last card played is the first one to take effect. Either way, once played, treasure cards are discarded. And if the treasure deck ever runs out when you're trying to collect a treasure card, reshuffle the discard pile and form a new one. During the game, if your hero is ever reduced to zero life points, they are defeated, and you place your miniature on its side. Your XP marker is then moved down the experience track to the last level up arrow that you reached. Now we haven't talked about these yet, but we will very soon. Then, if you have at least one treasure card, another player randomly removes one from your hand and discards it. If you're defeated, you do not receive any rewards for killing monsters that turn, and your turn immediately ends. While defeated, the hero is treated as if they aren't even there. Nothing can affect them, not even treasure cards, and they can't affect anything themselves. Though they may play treasure cards for their interrupt effects when the situation would apply. At the start of a defeated hero's next turn, stand it upright and restore it to full health, allowing it to take a turn as normal. So now let's talk about leveling up. Anytime your hero's XP marker lands on or crosses an XP space with an arrow, they level up. You then choose one of your hero's cards and slide it up to reveal one new ability. This is now immediately available to use. Each time that you level up, you can choose either the same card that you leveled up before, or you can instead level the other one. Just keep in mind, you can never reveal the bottom ability until you first leveled up the top one. And if you forget what your abilities are, you can always look at any point before you make your decision. Some heroes, like the wizard, can unlock a companion, which is represented by this white die. We're told to receive it, you first have to spend one gold. If the die is gained after you already rolled your other action dice that turn, then you may still roll and use it this turn, you just can't re-roll it. During your hero phase, after spending all the dice you want to, you gain one gold for each die that you didn't use. Keep in mind though, you can never have more than six gold at any one time but you can always spend five gold during your turn to buy a treasure card, and you're reminded of that cost right here. You can also never have more than six treasure cards at a time. If you gain an extra, then you must choose one of them to discard. After a player completes their hero phase, they must perform the dungeon master phase, even if they were defeated during their turn. First, they'll get two move points to divide amongst any monsters or bosses on the board. So they could move one monster two spaces, or two different monsters one space each. You could even choose to only spend one of your points, or none at all. Monsters can only move to adjacent revealed rooms through doors. However, they cannot move out of a room that is occupied by a hero, and if they move into a room with a the hero, they must stop. And monsters don't get along that well, so at most you can have three minor monsters in a single small room, or up to four in a medium room, keeping in mind that major monsters and bosses count as two minor monsters. So once we move this monster into the room here, this room is at its limit. But that limit only affects monsters. Any number of heroes could share this room with them. And although you may not choose to move a monster into a room if it would exceed the monster limit, sometimes an effect will force you to move extra monsters in. At that point, you then remove the monsters with the least XP from the room, returning them to the supply 
until the limit is again satisfied. After moving monsters, if any, you must spawn new ones in all rooms with this swirling spawn symbol that don't already have a monster or hero in them. For example, this room also has a spawn symbol, but it also has monsters and heroes in it, so we won't spawn anything new there. For any other valid room, you then take a die from the supply, matching the type of monster here, roll it, and then add it to the room. If you would ever need to spawn monsters during this step, for example, right here, and there are no dice of the required type left in the supply, then take a monster of that type from a room that doesn't contain a hero, if any, roll it, and then place it into that room. Once monsters are spawned, your turn ends, and you pass all six of the black action dice, no matter where they are, to the player on your left, who then takes their turn, starting with their hero phase. Once a player reaches or exceeds 16 experience points, play proceeds until all players have had an equal number of turns, which you can keep track of as the first player holds this first player torch the whole game. So if Algus had reached 16 points first, then Valric would get one more turn. But if instead Valric had reached 16 points first, they would each have already have had equal turns and the game would be over. Now players add any extra XP which might be provided by treasure cards they are holding and the one with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player with the most gold wins. If there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most life wins. And if there's still a tie, the players share the victory. And that's everything you need to know to play Mass Mora Dungeons of Arcadia. Now there are two other modes of play, Epic and Alliance, which are found on the last four pages of the rulebook, and I'll leave those for you to discover on your own. But if you have any questions about anything that you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.